Today is October the 6th and I'm standing in my mixed cover crop field. There's 11 different species out here planted on August the 5th following winter wheat. And we are in southwestern Ontario approximately 50 kilometers from Detroit, Michigan. So in this blend of cover crops there's 11 different species, 6 legumes, there's one brassicus being radish, sunflower, and three grasses. The grasses are annual rye, corn, one bag of corn, and there will be some volunteer wheat that came out from behind the combine. So the goal is with this cover crop is to mimic nature's image, getting back to uh, a plethora of different plant species away from a monoculture typically found in today's agriculture. So we're tricking the system, the system being the soil, to make it think back to the way that it was, it was intended from the outset. When you walk through the bush or the forest, you don't see a single species of tree. You don't see all maple or oak or ash. You see an abundance of different plants out there. Uh, you see a mix of hardwoods and uh, deciduous trees. And the same thing when you walk across the prairie found in, in western uh, North America, you don't just see grasses as a sole species out there, you see an abundant uh, array of plants. So what we've done here is we're utilizing these six legumes to capture nitrogen for next year's crop, which will be corn. And we're, uh, we're also using the grasses to, to act as a carbon sink. So as the legumes degrade, when it starts to freeze here, within the month we'll get our first frost and the, the, a lot of these plants will die and they'll start to shut down and they'll release the nitrogen that they have captured already thus far. And there's some really tremendous things going on in the soil with the nodulation that's going on with all the legumes out here. Uh, we've got some hairy vetch, we've got some soybeans actually, some Austrian winter peas. There's the odd, there's the odd uh, sun hemp out here as well that's uh, not native to the area. So uh, a lot of these plants, like I said, will die. But one thing that a lot of uh, farmers are really excited about today is uh, a plant called uh, nitro radish or tillage radish. Some people will hear it, but it's uh, an oil seed radish. And the, the goal is with the, the tuber of the radish is that it will scavenge for any nutrients that are available. Uh, specifically nitrogen, is, it's a real nitrogen pig. But a lot of farmers are uh, led down the garden path at the retail level and they're not encouraged to uh, plant a legume with it. And if this farm has not received any additional fertilizer since uh, planting, there's been no manure either. And that's where, um, if I had the luxury of having manure in the system, oilseed radish would be a very good choice because it would sop up all the nitrogen and the phosphorus uh, that comes from a lot of manure. But today, you can see here, I'm, in, I'm standing in one of the more modest areas of the field where we don't have a lot of biomass on the top that's accumulated, it's adequate, we've got lots of ground cover, but the nitrogen that's here is um, below the soil in the nodules. And I'm just going to come in here and right now and I'm going to just dig down to sort of a moderate sized uh, radish that's here amongst this blend of cover crop. see we dig, we dig down and we have a couple nice radishes that are side by side. You can actually see this one here kind of unique is that it's come down, it's sort of hit a hard part in the soil and it's taken a, a, a turn and then it's kept on gr going down. I've broken off the very long tip but you know for two months of growth that's pretty significant. Uh, it's deeper than a lot of people will plow. Uh, and it's, it's deeper definitely than a lot of people are going to do much, most forms of tillage. And uh, here's, like, here's two nice radishes and they'll just continue to get larger in diameter as we go through the season. You got a nice earthworm in there as well. A couple slugs. And I'm not too concerned about slugs as we go forward. Um, most people get paranoid about slugs, but when you provide um, a buffet of green and as they decay, the slugs will have lots of food to eat other than your intended crop that you're going to plant in the subsequent season. So this is what's uh, happening here. We see we have lots of nice soil aggregation going on. And we can just break those uh, particles those right of, with your hands. And last night we just uh, received just a tenth of an inch of rain. So not a lot of rain, but they're like these uh, 
the soil stability, the aggregates just break apart in your fingertips. So it's amazing here and we have all this real nice fine uh, soil on the surface. And what really amazes me is if you look here closely at this radish, you'll see right behind it usually is adhered a bunch of legumes in this blend. And here we have hairy vetch and it's tap roots going down and there's all kinds of nodules that are here on the hairy vetch and that tuber was laying right there tight to those nodules absorbing all of that and that's being produced so the plants are living in a symbiotic relationship uh, benefiting each other and the harder that this radish works to take away nitrogen the more that this plant keeps continuing to pump nitrogen and so it's uh it's just it's all about working together in a system uh, to protect the soil if you look over my shoulder we have a field that was conventionally tilled and it's a stark comparison to this field that's going to be green right straight through the winter uh, on into the spring. So after the frost comes, uh, the majority of the plants will be gone. So of the 11 species, I believe three will be left in the spring. There will be cereal rye, there will be some volunteer wheat, and there will most likely be the hairy vetch. And, either in a, and on a on a real benefit, I should see some crimson clover and some Austrian winter peas. So that's all from this part of southwestern Ontario. Thanks for watching.